I'd like to start probably with uh, Charles Van Riper because uh, he said really that it boils down to an interruption of the forward flow of speech and that if this occurs often enough that it will produce uh, a negative reaction from society and that it will perhaps make the person maladjusted. Uh, so that is probably the simplest way to put it, I would say. Now, there are all sorts of other things here. Uh, there's such a thing as inner stuttering, but I think for uh, simplicity's sake that the thing of just saying that it is a stoppage in the forward flow of speech, and I think above all that it's important to say that it's involuntary because the research has been showing that it is impossible really to duplicate a true stuttering interruption. Dr. Sheehan and I uh, knew him for roughly 40 years and I think that his concept of that iceberg is very meaningful indeed. That is that we see and hear only the surface symptom of it that's above the water and that to reduce the problem that you have to melt the whole berg in size. The bottom part has all of these hidden things, the shame, the guilt, the anxiety, and so forth. Dr. West, Dr. Robert West said that to him it was a matter of uh, some type of a weakness that affected the speech mechanism and that the disorder was perpetuated by a continuation, continuation of that weakness or by a morbid awareness of the difficulty. And, but Dr. West went on to say that it's very likely a combination of both of those factors that makes it into the problem. And uh, of course, I myself have always leaned toward an organic thinking or theory for the basis of the difficulty. I've always been of that mind, but it's been really uh, reconfirmed by the newer research that we now have that does show that the brain is not operating exactly in the same way when there is stuttering occurring. We have better means of measurement nowadays. So I say that we're getting a better outline of the etiology of the difficulty we're getting a better outline in the fog. There is no set therapy that fits one individual exactly. You've got to know the person. You cannot separate the disorder from the person himself or herself. You cannot do it. It is impossible because this thing as Wendell Johnson had written in his marvelous book, Because I Stutter from 1930, which I have read very many times over, and I think it's the best book to explain what it's like to be at the bottom of the valley. Uh, he said it's like a vine that gets all tangled up in the branches of a tree. Stuttering is like that. Lee Travis had, combined with Dr. Orton, the cerebral dominance theory of about 1920 seven or so, which was very popular. And they did all sorts of experiments at Iowa. Uh, <clears throat> they both were there on the faculty. And uh, the years of hoping to shift handedness and so on did not seem to bring about the favorable results that they had hoped for. At that time, Wendell Johnson was, was there, as was Van Riper, and they both stuttered very severely. And Wendell Johnson said that he had his hand put into a cast to try to change handedness, and it did not apparently have any results on the severity of his problem. Uh, Charles Van Riper was there, and very severe, he could hardly say one word even. Lee was a very interesting man. He, he was a marvelous scientist for experimental work. He had all kinds of very fancy instruments and he got measurements that I think are very significant even yet 
from some of the research that he had done back as far as 1925 and 6. And uh, to this day, we feel that there is something in that cerebral dominance theory that speaks truth even yet. Uh, it may not be exactly the factor, but he was along the right pathway. Lee was along the right pathway, I think, then. And that is part of the reason why I do lean toward an organic thinking. Wendell Johnson went through all kinds of experiments. He got in to Iowa to seek help for his speech when he was about age 20 or so. He was very severe and uh, they put him through all kinds of experiments and tried to shift his handedness and whatnot. And he really did not improve very much until he met a man named Alfred Korzybski. And he was a semanticist. He was a scientist who said that the words we use to describe ourselves to ourselves, in other words, the thinking we have about ourselves and the language that we use to describe ourselves to ourselves is very important. And that how we use that language will mold behavior. And so he met Wendell Johnson and between the two of them, they licked each other clean, as Wendell said once. And he hadn't met anyone who had been stuttering severely, apparently. But what Wendell had learned was that it was very important for him, Wendell, to learn about a language that he should begin to develop that would explain his behavior to himself. And he began to feel that stuttering was not something that happened to you, but that it is something that you did yourself and that you had a choice. And by the way that you spoke of yourself to yourself, in other words, your inner language, you could shift some of that behavior. Dr. Charles Blumel was a psychiatrist on rhythm, and it had to do with the system that was used by Columba in France as far back as 1830, namely to speak to each syllable in time to a metronome. From him I learned that you have to learn to try to think in a fluent way that we speak according to the way we think and that we have to reorganize our basic speech, that the speech was not securely organized in childhood and that we would have to work at reorganizing it into fluent segments as an adult. And he for years wasted his energies doing uh, costal breathing, diaphragmatic breathing, all these things, but it didn't pay off until he realized that he had to learn to think in a fluent way. And I know myself that I had begun to recover by modifying the blocks and got much more fluent, but was left with a lot of uh, Disrhythm and stuff, and I began to work at some of, on some of those ideas that Blue Mel had espoused, and that managed to knit my speech together a little better, I think. Bring Bringelson, he was a charming man, and uh, he came to Wisconsin in 1959 to take part in a, a seminar that they had up there that was fascinating. They had Wendell Johnson there, and they had Joe Sheehan. At different times, they came for for two or three days each, but it was one of the finest things that I have ever attended on the subject of stuttering. I got to know him, and I think his thinking is very, very neurological, of course. And uh, he speaks about the fact that he was one of the first to use what we call voluntary stuttering. And this was an offshoot from Knight Dunlop, who in the 1920s had found that 
if you make a mistake and you do it on purpose, then you are much less likely to make that mistake in the future. And so uh, Bring adopted this into his therapy and uh, he also used bouncing a great deal. He felt that the higher parts or higher parts of the brain, the cortex, did not do a very good job of monitoring when the organism was upset in any way or was under stress. And that if you could learn to do things voluntarily, it would exercise those higher centers somewhat and would let you feel that you had control over your involuntary moments. Bringleson was the first one to say to me, you should go on and get a PhD. And uh, if it hadn't been for Bring, I feel that uh, I might never have begun the doctorate. I might never have gone into the university level. I wanted to go into the field and I sort of made a deal with myself that my speech had to improve to a level where I'd get by. But it was on thin ice for a long time because in those days, I think it was much, much harder to get accepted in the profession. Nowadays, I notice a shift. And why do we have this shift? I think in part because ASHA is realizing more and more how deep stuttering is.